So tonight, we're going to be talking to you about why public housing matters. And I'm going to start by just sharing with you a bit of the history uh, of NYCHA and our plan to save the public housing here in town. It's a, a plan we're calling Next Generation NYCHA. I'm going to ask for your help as well. And Janelle has kind of already shared with you sort of the outline of that. And you'll be hearing more about focus groups and things that we're going to be planning and looking for your support moving forward. Um, I know you'll have plenty of questions, uh, and we'll have a panel right after this presentation to, uh, to answer questions that you may have, and a recognition that any questions that don't get answered will be going through the borough president to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to get their, their questions responded to. All right, so why should we fight for public housing? We should fight for public housing because uh, it's a way that housing here in New York can truly stay affordable for the long term. Uh, NYCHA's rents are always tied to income. So if you're a NYCHA resident, your rent will never be more than 30% of whatever your adjusted income is. So if, you're increased, if your income decreases, so will your rent. So another reason to fight so hard for public housing, we are the largest providers of low-income housing in New York City. Uh, we provide almost 75% of all housing for rental units under $500 a month, and half of the housing for rental units under $800 a month here in New York. And a third and a very important reason why we should need to fight for public housing so much, because of our public housing residents, 77,000 of us are seniors and about 110,000 of us are children. So we support some of the most vulnerable and needy residents here in New York. Do you know that uh, public housing tenant rights uh, are guaranteed residents in other type of housing in the city? We, the public housing tenant rights are really an important component of this. And it's, it's reason, another reason why we need to fight for public housing. Uh, rents are capped at 30% of income. There's a guaranteed lease renewal if, uh, if you're staying in good standing. We're among the strongest eviction protections in the nation. There are succession rights, and I know Theo will be talking more about that. They're, they're associated with this, and, uh, which aren't uh, associated with other types of housing. And that we're one of the few housing uh, uh, entities that support resident leadership and resident empowerment through tenant associations and those activities. Um, so we also provide funds to uh, build tenant uh, uh, activities uh, like family fun days and enrichment activities. So why fight for public housing? New York City is committed to public housing. For years, the federal government has steadily defested in public housing. Funds for the New York City Housing Authorities have dropped uh, over $2 billion since 2001. Many states, like the state of New York, have completely divested in public housing. Uh, New York State has not allocated operating funding to New York City public housing since 1998. And divestment has forced many cities to take critical steps. Um, I, I think it was noted earlier, I had the opportunity and the honor to serve as the public housing director in San Francisco, in New Orleans, Louisiana, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and in Washington, D.C. And those are cities that have dramatically, dec uh, dramatically changed how public housing operates and what it looks like. What they've done is they've demolished public housing. Uh, Chicago is one of the bigger examples of the demolishing of the public housing, in which uh, there's been a, uh, the divestment has been such that they that they had to tear it down and not make housing available for for folks who desperately needed in Chicago, and Atlanta, Georgia is another model in which they've actually totally divested their traditional public housing. They've gone to a voucher system, and it's a different kind of animal altogether. Well, here in New York, we appreciate public housing for how, what it's done for generations in the past, and we appreciate what it will be do, doing for generations in the future, and we're committed to preserving and protecting it in every way we possibly can. But it's a very expensive task, and it's one that, that we're we've, uh, lacking some uh, commitments on the federal government level, and it's something that's truly a dire situation. Our current operating expenses continue to rise, and uh, our projected Subsidy sources continue to decrease, and cumulatively, if we don't do anything about this, we're going to be facing a total $2.5 billion deficit by 2025. And as this graph shows, uh, if we do nothing by 2025 on an annual basis, we'll be about $425 million um, in, def in a deficit situation. What that means is the kind of drastic measures that have happened in Chicago and other places, New York City will have to deal with. So we have to do something right now. 
We have to recognize that this is a critical situation, and it's going to take a variety of, of uh, activities to respond to it. One of the most uh, challenging things that we have is our, the, our public housing sites in New York City are, are very old. 80% of our 2,600 buildings are more than 40 years old. And in fact, our buildings need a total of over $17 billion for capital work. Since 2001, we've been shortchanged by the federal government by more than $2 billion uh, of federal funding, money that should have gone to things like roofs and things like elevators and things like uh, uh, grounds and apartments that we just never got. And so we're facing this, this tremendous backlog of infrastructure need. Roofs, facades, elevators, heating systems have gone without the critical repairs that we've, we've required for many uh, years. And what this has meant is delays in our responding to work orders and delays in, in, in quality of life activities that we, we want to support. What that means is that, again, that our residents have been uh, forced to live with diminished quality of life, uh, including more than 77,000 seniors who are aging in place. The wait list of low-income families in need of our housing is actually larger than the number of families who currently live in NYCHA developments. The path we're on is fundamentally not sustainable. Uh, it's not sustainable for NYCHA, it's not sustainable for our organization, it's not sustainable for New York City. Something must be done and it must be done right now. Tough decisions must be made and it, we just have to do business in a different kind of way. When the mayor uh, appointed our chair, uh, who, by the way, just had a baby and she would be here tonight, but uh, uh, she's, she's now uh, back, on, back on the case. And, and, but when they first met and they talked about uh, New York City housing authorities and the commitments, the mayor charged uh, Shola to uh, reestablish our relationship with our residents to create a long-term sustainable plan that will enable the authority to overcome the challenges and to assure long-term sustainability into the future. So the chair got to work on a stakeholder engagement process to create a plan to bring NYCHA back to the brink and ensure that, that it will always be a pathway for opportunities for our families for today and for tomorrow. So in the last year and a half, we've talked to over 5,000 residents, employees, and community organizations and advocates, elected officials from all over the five boroughs, getting input and feedback on what we can do to turn NYCHA around and improve the quality of life for our residents. The chair visited more than 100 developments, held dozens of town hall meetings, and engaged nearly every elected official who represents our communities. From this process, we created a strategic plan, a roadmap for the next 10 years, a plan that we call Next Generation NYCHA. The plan, safe, clean, connected communities. That is the vision. We are recognizing that this is, these are the, this is the kind of vision that, that came out of these meetings, the kind of feedback that we got. What we are looking to develop is clean, safe, and connect, connected, healthy communities. Within this, we've established four goals. One, to look at, at how we achieve our funding, both short and long term. We want to become fiscally responsible and manage our funds prudently so we support our needs um, down, currently and down the road. We're looking at different ways in how we operate to be more efficient and more effective. And it's first and foremost uh, recognition that public housing and NYCHA is a landlord. That's what we do. We provide the best possible services for our customers, you, the residents of public housing, and that's the bottom line, and we have to recognize that's our core responsibility is to operate in a, in a very efficient manner. We're also looking to rebuild. Rebuild, expand, and preserve our, our, this critical stock of public housing. And it's a really exciting area of next generation NYCHA. It's one in which there's really so much untapped potential for us to, uh, to develop the kind of uh, power and the value of our buildings and the value of our land and our open spaces. And that has the, the power to dramatically improve the lives of the folks that are currently living in public housing. And as Neil said earlier on, critically, Embedded in all of this is uh, a fresh engagement process, uh, process. We want to connect residents to the best class services in their communities that have the power to transform their lives. So we're looking to engage and to reconnect in the city that we have not done in, in the past. You know, again, I think that I, this is, as, as the borough president said, my second tour of duty here. The one thing that's different now than it was the first time is a recognition that public housing is an integral part of the city. For so many years, uh, and not just here but across the country, public housing has stand as sort of a standalone entity. It was federally funded, it had federal rules, it was not necessarily embraced by the city. This administration truly embraces it and really gives us an opportunity to, to leverage the resources of the city to, to, uh, to not only preserve public housing but to make uh, opportunities for our residents greater. So again, 
Uh, because of this, this, this call for reengagement, the mayor has uh, already provided relief in the form of $77 million for police payments, as well as $33 million for a tax that, that, uh, that we used to pay, a payment in lieu of taxes, uh, for, which is kind of a property tax. These two things have already been committed to by the mayor, and these, these critical funds have already begun to uh, be allocated to our maintenance and our, and our repair needs. We will re it, we're, part of our plan, again, is to look at these, these different uh, strategic initiatives. One of them is to lease unused space on our ground floors of our developments to better serve our residents and to generate revenue. We'll be generating revenue by also leasing parking places that, uh, that aren't be currently being used by our, by our, our residents, and uh, to look at, at ways in which we can um, uh, to find creative ways to find additional revenue, and that additional revenue will quickly be turned right back into providing services for repair work and work order production, et cetera. We're going to be locally, prop we're going to look at, a, at developing a localized ways of property management. NYCHA has traditionally been a very much a top down bureaucratic um, management organization. We're now looking to flatten the organization and give responsibility to property managers to make the kind of decisions and to make the kinds of, of uh, resource reallocations that, that may be different in one part of town than a different part of town or from one borough from a different borough. So as opposed to a monolithic organization, we're looking to have a more redistributed uh, sort of property based uh, management style. We'll be looking at a variety of, of pilot uh, programs along those lines that will be looking to uh, uh, provide better quality control, but most importantly to provide the kind of services and the service levels that, by the t by, uh, that would like shorten the amount of time between a repair is asked for and a repair is responded to. We're continuing to install lighting, cameras, doors, and layered access to develop a programming around our 15 high crime developments designated through the Mayor's Action Plan. Um, and we're going to be continuing to look at the best practices around public safety. NYCHA has issued a request for proposals to build 100% affordable housing units on underutilized land at three developments. These units will be deeply affordable to families of three earning $46,000. Uh, we've also provided a, a type of mix of affordable market rate housing on a, on a limited number of these underutilized sites. And we'll be looking at providing and creating partnerships uh, with uh, uh, world-class providers. So we're, again, folks that are really uh, in the philanthropic world or in the nonprofit world or folks that are, are, are providers, we'll be looking to, to reach out to them to, de to develop those kind of partnerships. So these are the types of uh, strategies that make up our next generation NYCHA. So following these, um, these strategies, we'll be looking to uh, uh, put the Housing Authority on, on sound financial footing. Financial stability en enables NYCHA to perform capital improvements such as roof repairs and boiler replacements that can solve many of the recurring issues that you, the residents of pu public housing, uh, have and then impact the quality of your life. But this will not happen overnight. As they say, uh, we didn't get here right away and it's gonna take us a minute to get out of the situation. The most important thing though is to recognize that this is a critical time in NYCHA's history and we must do something about it that the current, that the, the, the current situation uh, cannot Cannot, is not sustainable. We cannot deal with the status quo. But with your help and the help of elected officials, officials like the mayor, Borough President Brewer, uh, the council leadership, uh, Vic Bach and Judith Goldner, others that are advocates, the resident leadership, uh, we are uh, confident that we will be on the track to success. So again, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I hope that you will help make Next, next Generation NYCHA a success. I want you to, be, to, to consider signing up and be parting our Next Generation NYCHA's focus groups. We want to hear from you, the residents, about what you think is important as we move forward. So please see one of the NYCHA re resident engagement representatives outside of this, uh, this meeting hall. Uh, we have a resource table set up. And just uh, to see if you would like to be part of, uh, of assisting us think through better ways that we can, uh, can, can fulfill our, our mandate. So again, thank you so very much. Um, and we are, will be available to answer questions that you might have. Thanks again. Okay, I'm going to try to quickly focus on what I think are some basic changes in the NYCHA landscape that will directly affect residents that are part of uh, the next generation NYCHA plan. The most dramatic changes, I think, will come from affordable housing development on NYCHA sites, what used to be called the infill program, and secondly, from the conversion or transfer of certain high-cost NYCHA developments 
to alternative ownership and management. And uh, that's, that's what I'd like to concentrate my remarks on. From the moment that uh, Mayor de Blasio took office and Shola Olatoye became chair of NYCHA, they were very clear that they were going to move forward with uh, a program of affordable housing development in NYCHA communities. We knew that, but we didn't know how much development would be involved. The Next Generation Plan lays it out. There will be 17,000 units of new housing constructed on NYCHA sites. If we figure that uh, roughly 170 units per new development, how many sites are going to be affected? Roughly 100 of NYCHA's uh, Tower in the Park development. And that's roughly one out of three. So uh, I want to emphasize that uh, for those resident leaders who are here, that uh, uh, when uh, NYCHA comes knocking at your door with a, an invitation for community visioning, uh, which I think you should accept, uh, uh, that you ought to have your resident associations as strong as possible so that you can negotiate the best possible arrangement for your residents. So it's important to be prepared. Uh, then uh, there will be, as I mentioned, uh, some of the high cost developments that will be uh, converted or transferred out of the NYCHA public housing inventory into other forms of affordable housing. There are two major categories there. One are the uh, scattered site development. There are thousands of units in scattered site developments. Those are lower rise buildings that NYCHA took over mostly during the 1970s as a result of the wave of owner abandonment. And second category are those tower in the park developments that NYCHA assesses as being, too co uh, as being higher cost to rehabilitate than it would take to construct. By HUD's definition, those are called, quotation marks, obsolete or distressed developments. In both those cases, uh, NYCHA plans over the next 10 years to transfer ownership and management, for instance, of the scattered site developments to nonprofit owners who will continue to retain it as affordable housing and who will uh, see to its rehabilitation under available programs. As for the distressed NYCHA tower in the park developments, I think NYCHA will try to use federal programs like RAD. I don't know how many of you have heard of the HUD rental assistance demonstration. If not, you will be hearing about it soon. Uh, as a way to transfer those developments to a new ownership entity in which hopefully NYCHA will play a part, uh, but it will be a path out of the public housing inventory. So that in total, uh, the, the there are 15,000 units, roughly a tenth of NYCHA apartments that will be converted either because they're scattered site or in distressed developments. And they will be, continue I assume to be affordable, but again it's best that you be aware of what your development is a candidate for under the 10-year plan so that you can be uh, prepared and have your resident organization as strong as possible to address the issues that, uh, that come up. Uh, apart from that, I would strongly urge you to, uh, uh, to uh, be sure to take a look at the NYCHA Next Generation Plan. It's huge. So it's not easy going. Look at the executive summary or uh, come to other town halls. Um, and uh, 
come to the uh, NYCHA's public hearing. It will be a unique opportunity to testify and present your views on the Next Generation Plan. That will be Tuesday, August 11th in the evening, and uh, uh, you should be getting information about that. Thank you very much. So I just want to start with one question, because, um, and I want Ethel Velez to make sure that you have the first question that comes from the uh, group. So Madam Velez, when you're ready, we will take whatever question you would like. But my question is the issue of maintenance, which is the one that I hear the most. Now, it's no money from the governor. It's going individually to elected officials for the maintenance or other items. Uh, therefore, the roof is still a problem. So I know that your plan talks about input and working together and calling to action, but is there some way that we should be thinking about this maintenance that would help you and help the tenants? Is there some way of looking at that as an ongoing, endless challenge? I am only too aware of it because it's been going on for a very long time. So I didn't know if there was some way that we could think of this together, even in this large forum. Somebody can help to answer that. Go ahead, Michael. If I can, uh, Madam uh, Borough President. Uh, yeah, I think that I, I think you're right on point is to recognize that, uh, that there is a relationship between capital need and work orders. As our offices get deluged with rightfully so uh, uh, needs of plastering and, and uh, paint and, and things that are, are breaking down, there's a really a relationship between things like fixing a roof or, or replacing the elevators or replacing the boiler systems that really need to be done. And when I mentioned that $17 billion earlier, uh, one of the anecdotes we talk about is that that, that amount of money can buy, uh, you could buy the Yankees and build seven Yankee stadiums with that, just to put things in a, in a context of how big that, that is. But to your question, I think it's just really just uh, you know, lobbying, uh, particularly on the federal level, uh, where I believe that's where, that's where the, the, the prime responsibility of public housing needs to be, the importance of the capital program, and a recognition that, that it's a partnership here uh, with the state as well as with the city. Yeah, but the state's not giving us any money. Who are we partnering with? <laughs> okay, I'm just saying, I, it's not your fault, but I just call it like it is. So we have... So right now, I guess each assembly person, our state senator, to their credit, is Robert still here? Yes. We will be able to use that funding, but not say more. Is that the general notion that we have right now? Okay. Brian, go ahead. You can introduce yourself, too. <clears throat> sure. Um, so this is uh, Brian Honan, uh, Director of Intergovernmental Relations at uh, the Housing Authority. Um, the one thing you can say is, over the last year, we've seen a tremendous difference uh, locally in how public housing is viewed. The mayor forgave the pilot. The mayor forgave uh, NYPD playmates. That's something that those of you in this audience had called on for years and years, probably thinking it was never going to happen. And I think we've seen that elections matter, that leadership matters, and that you can have true local leadership um, and that will make a difference. So that's $100 million extra that we can use um, to help solve our deficit, to help you know get... Uh, repairs done in a quicker uh, manner. In the state, maybe it's going to take, um, and <clears throat> Assemblyman Rodriguez was a leader in Albany. When tenants went up to Albany, he was there with them, uh, calling on the state to make sure that those dollars were funneled in a responsible way to the housing authority. But maybe it's going to take some people in the state, we don't have to mention names, a little bit longer to get the message. But I know next year, a bunch of us will be there uh, to call on the state for to do the right thing. Okay. Ethel, do you have a microphone? Yes. Yes, I do. I think I just want to make a statement for all the resident leaders that are here. I think each one of us is our own little town individually, and there's some issues that go on with all of the developments, but some of us have special issues. But overall, I think this is a wonderful event to have us here. But one of our biggest problems is a few words that we really don't like. We don't like engagement. We don't like transparency because none of those words fit what goes on. The resident leaders are not really engaged. They are spoke at. We do not really participate in anything. We are told whatever administration comes, they change things. They don't ask us what worked and what didn't work. And they wind up flopping a lot. 
So when we talk about infrastructure, where did all of the police money go? Because we didn't have a budget for police. So we were told that they took, they had the infrastructure money, they put it to the police department. So when you have agencies that change and use monies as they will, and it's the residents at the end of the day that suffer, we would rather that you really come and talk to the resident leadership. First of all, we are your volunteers. We have interaction with more of the agency than the agency have interaction with. Maybe not you, Mr. Kelly, but everybody else. You know, so no one really talked to us. No one really asked us our ideas. I see you have the cards. I know we have these forums. But they're not really anything that we really feel a part of. So we have so many questions that don't get answered. So we sit here, we listen, and meanwhile we still, people feel we're being sold out. They don't know what's going on. We come up with all these new ideas of new programs. And the big fear is there's no more low-income housing and people are going to be sold out. So if we can really start talking the truth, <laughs> let us have a real conversation. And other than that, this is good. It's a start. But my request, let's have a real conversation about what's happening with public housing. So, Madam President, Madam President, I have a question for you, which is how, in your view, would, I don't want to use the word engagement or transparency, <laughs> but what in your world, because you and I have been around for a long time, what in your vision would a real program that answered your questions look like? What would a, I mean, you and I have seen situations come and go, situations not be fulfilled. So how would you feel that this process could have a positive outcome? I think the process would have a positive outcome if people told the truth about what they were doing. Since they're not telling the truth exactly, it's like we gotta figure it out. But resident leaders aren't stupid. You know, we don't take the position because we want to be glorified, because there's no glory in all this volunteer work. So as we sit, well, it might be for some, but as we sit here, I would like to have a conversation with the administration about the complete program, about what goes on, who lives in their buildings, why they don't know who live in their buildings, all the things that go on in the developments that really, it's a domino effect that happens with everything else. You know, who's taking your supplies? What happens with a whole lot of stuff? We could tell you everything that goes on in the development. And don't have to pay us $10 million like the consulting group. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. I don't know if you want to respond. I think one of the issues would be, without using the word transparency, how do, do residents or the public know when money is reallocated, where it goes? Obviously, that would be one question for the police money or other things. We know where it went before, we didn't really know. But now that it's part of NYCHA, NYCHA doesn't have to pay it essentially, is there some way of knowing how that allocation has changed in terms of the residents and where it went or didn't go? Is there any way of doing that? I think, you, you know, as mentioned, Victor mentioned the August 11th town hall meeting in, in which we talked about the annual plan. We've got a responsibility to share uh, with all the residents, um, and we, we actually have a series of, I think it's seven different town hall meetings leading up to the one on the 11th, okay. in which uh, we are, much like you're doing tonight, uh, Borough President, is allowing for the kind of dialogue to go through. We'll be doing presentations the entire time. That plan called the, uh, the, the annual plan that it gets produced has a lot of information, more information in it than I think people realize. Right. Yeah. So I think I'd urge everyone to, uh, to look, you know, check your calendars for when the... Okay. Uh, I, mean, I think what they're looking for a little bit is when money is essentially given or returned to NYCHA, essentially, literally a spreadsheet as to where it went. So we could talk about that. But that's kind of what they're looking for, to be honest with you. All right. <laughs> A uh, question is, which nonprofit community-based organizations, either one or several, will be managing NYCHA properties in East Harlem? I don't know who wants to answer that. I don't know. Uh, but introduce yourself. Hi. Nicole Ferrer, Development Department at NYCHA. Um, so nonprofits that we're partnering with? Is yes, that the question? Yeah. So we haven't chosen any nonprofit organizations at this point. We're in the very early stages 
of uh, working through so our plan. So what would nonprofits be doing, for instance, as part of the plan or part of the input, and how do people get input to it, you know, et cetera, et cetera? So um, we will definitely be coming to the resident organizations as soon as we uh, get our plan together to speak to them about um, what developments this would entail and what that would look okay, like. Because that's when they get upset because they want to know in advance of yes. all of that. Yes. That's where we're trying. I think, um, Madam President, I like calling Ethel Velez Madam President. Um, I think that the concept would be to have the discussions of the plan itself before you even get to that point. That's right. sort of what they're right. saying. Yes. Because when you start talking about this development, it's going to get this RFP. That's when people get upset. Yes. Yeah, so we're not even we're not even there yet. So. So where are we? Noted. So we are. <laughs> one minute. Yes. We are looking through the portfolio to see which developments need uh, the highest capital repairs. General and housing. so. Shh. Quiet. Quiet. And that meet uh, the HUD programs. And then we're going to engage with the residents to talk through what that would look like. All right. That's where we are. And, uh, can I just say, so just last week we released an RFP for three... Uh, request for proposal. Request for proposal for three different uh, affordable housing projects. One at Van Dyke Houses in Brooklyn, one in Ingersoll in, uh, in Fort Greene, and one in Millbrook Houses. We started engaging with residents a year before the RFP came out. We, were to we formed a committee with residents to talk about the type of housing they would like to see. Um, folks in Millbrook and folks in Ingersoll said that they wanted to see, I mean, folks in um, Millbrook and Van Dyke said they wanted to see senior housing. Folks in uh, Ingersoll wanted to see family type housing. Um, and so the engagement began early. Um, folks complained that there were too many meetings, so which is a good thing. That's when you know you're really reaching people. So that type of engagement is going to go on in the future. Okay, so we won't be ha finding out by reading anything. We'll be engaged in, in advance. Okay. Um, from uh, a tenant leader, why were senior centers closed with no input from the residents? They were um, not asked, the resident associations were not asked if they could run their own center. So what's the status with the centers? Janelle Hudson from Resident Engagement. Sorry, Ms. Velez, that's the name of my department. <laughs> um, <laughs> formerly Community Operations. So we just, in June, on June 30th of this year, closed all of our community centers that we uh, were operating as of June 30th. And this is actually the third round of closures. Prior to that, the year before, we closed centers um, two years prior to that, and the first set of closures occurred in 2008. So there's, over time, we know that, and we've seen the fiscal situation of NYCHA, that the funding has dwindled and continues to dwindle. We um, have presented to residents and resident leaderships that this is what we're faced with. So it wasn't that it just happened in June at the last moment. Um, it's been over time. And what we've done is partner with our city organizations, uh, the sister agencies, to bring best-in-class services to our residents. And that's not to say that the services that our staff were providing was not good services, it was quality services. However, the scope of what we were able to provide just did not compare and match to what the agencies that the city has that is able that does currently provide those services can do. As an example, as an example, um, in June we were able to, based on our staffing levels and anybody who knows after school programming, we're mandated by Department of Health to operate at a one to ten staff to child ratio. We had 53 staff across all of the centers assigned to uh, to run the centers. That limited us to serving 530 children. The slots that DYCD can provide to our residents for just that age group is 5,912 versus 530. We're looking at partnerships and ways to bring services to more of our residents as opposed to a limited group. So where are we with the Seniors in terms of the future, though. 
specifically? This, all, of, all of the senior centers and community centers that we closed in June were reopened July 1st mm -hmm. with community-based organization providers who are funded through DYCD and DIFTA, respectively. And, and I should know this, but were the RAs, resident associations, uh, introduced, involved, and so on? We did hold meetings and we introduced the resident associations, but okay. we introduced them in June. Okay. Once, once, once everything was finalized and once we knew that we were able to move forward, we needed to have confirmation from, that the funding was there and that the agencies would be able to take over. That's when we did have meetings with the resident leadership. We did hear that um, they wanted to have it sooner, that involvement in the selection um, needed to happen, but there's intricacies around the process that we could not avoid, as such as amending um, service contracts that were already existing in the areas of where we needed them to provide services. Okay, and um, did, you, did you find that you were able to find culturally appropriate local nonprofits to take over these contracts, or were they larger agencies? Yeah, I don't know, I'm asking. I don't they're know. agencies that, because there was an amendment to Intake DYCD, an amendment to existing contracts, there were community-based organizations that are already in the community that they'll be serving, that they just amended the contract. Okay, so if people have issues, then we in the borough president's office, we can work with you on the senior issues. We'd and can I just say that an RFP will be coming out in the fall for services. So these are just amendments. They're not the, the um, permanent provider. What, what services would that be? In for, the for the operation of, of community centers and senior centers through DYCD right. and so, so I think we follow up with what... Uh, President Velez stated is that, again, when we quickly do the analysis with the resident leaders about next gen, then we have to have the same discussion about the RFP process and how it works and how they can have input. Because the general public doesn't understand it. Yeah. I don't understand it. And I think general, generally leaders need to have much more understanding of that process. Absolutely agree. And I would again ask everyone who is willing to sign up for one of our focus groups. Okay, all right. Um, how, how much money is used for policing? We don't feel safe. We need housing police to do more. Drugs are sold out of units every day, and we know that guns and drugs are not a good thing. So how does the whole policing budget work, and how does it impact? How, 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 how can we be, I'm gonna use this word transparent, on the issue of policing and funding? Mr. Kelly, thank uh, you. Yeah, uh, I had a chance to spend um, quite a bit of time with, with Chief Secreto, who's, uh, who's the Housing Bureau uh, uh, Commandant. And uh, we uh, recently actually had a, uh, a, a graduation of about 159 cadets just like last weekend. For PSA. For PSA. Okay. And, that, um, and that I think what we're talking about is, is again, um, uh, there's a mandate uh, from, from Bratton about uh, revisiting community-oriented policing, and right. specifically, I think that's the type of approach that, that lends itself best at, at NYCHA. Um, we talked about uh, how uh, there's a delicate balance between showing respect of, of folks at the same time making sure that, that um, crime gets addressed. But I think what we did talk about, that it's not a single enforcement issue, that the cops have a very important role to play but the role that you continue to play and the elected leaders play in terms of providing additional resources for us to put in cameras and lights and the layered accesses is critical because we don't have those dollars in our own budget to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, to look at our property management functions around lease enforcement to make sure that folks know that there's that that you know that folks can't do crime as part of you know the quiet enjoyment part of the of it. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's really again it's, it gets back to that word. I forget. Forgive me, <laughs> Madam President. Engagement. Looking about how do we partner with resident leaderships, particularly. But, but see, I would say in that situation that you sit down with a resident leader. Holly Spain, Ethel Velez, everybody who's here, and say, okay, this is a budget that is allocated to your development. This is the timing that we have in terms of the shifts. Some people are using, some precincts are using PSA. Some are using local precincts. That's not just PSA. Mm -hmm. And then have a discussion, literally, with the tenant leadership about that. Because I don't think they know exactly what is the allocation for policing and funding in their development. Mm -hmm. And then you can figure out also what some of the other ancillary criminal challenges are. So, because I don't think people have a sense of what exactly is uh, being paid for in their development. Mm -hmm. 
that's the problem. And they can add, they can add for the cameras and so on, you know. But it's that people are so smart, as you know, in the leadership. And so I think they just want more specifics. Yep. And in some cases, it might mean that the local precinct could chip in more if that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that's where, that's where the rub hits the road. Rubber hits the road, I'm, I think, from my limited experience. Is that something that, that we could sit down and do? Is that Absolutely. absolutely. We've been, I mean, a real talk. breakdown per development. Yeah. And so input. I, got my, I have my board in front of me here, so I think I, I see them nodding on this. Okay. So, so um, you know, the great thing that happened last year is that we got away from this system that should, probably never should have been put in place, where NYCHA was paying for police service. I mean, that people live in Stytown, people live in Co-op City, people live in developments throughout the um, city that are not public housing, do not have to pay an extra tax for police service. We're all New Yorkers, we all pay our taxes here, and we should be safe no matter where we live. I think what, I think what we've seen as a big difference under this administration is that a real coordination between NYPD, between the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and we're seeing community centers that are open to midnight. We're seeing uh, the Office of Domestic Violence going door to door and partnering people locally. We're seeing uh, lights in, develop in the 15 developments of the map um, so it's as bright during the night as it is during the day. We're seeing a real community policing effort and things like that need to, so let's get away from how much is being spent and sort of how can we work together between NYPD and the community? And you know, Brian, people still want to know how much is being spent. Okay, they, they want they need you to know, know and that. And, and you know, maybe you know that they need to know that. It's, it would help, I think, with trust. And so, where NYCHA can be is a partner with NYPD, right? Um, and we can, you know, where where uh, we can we can bring them along to talk about these things. Okay, that would be helpful. Development by development. What is being done? with the work orders that are not being answered, and I know that Knight is trying really hard to deal with the backlog, um, and this person suggests that you use as a first measure um, some of the you know care and concerns of the Knight attendance, which I think you are, but how do we deal with the work orders? Um, and I know you're also dealing in the plan with trying to figure out between the CCC and 311 and how you, how you uh, track some of these work orders, so. How you doing? My name is Luis Ponce. I'm with Operations Support Services. So we're actually working on a few initiatives on how to better service residents and how to make sure that the work orders are addressed. Um, we're looking at our, our resident not at home policy. Um, there sometimes if, if a resident misses an appointment, that that work order gets closed. Uh, we're finding a way to reach out to the resident, give them another opportunity. Uh, we're also looking to make sure that we have the parts on hand when we get there, that we have the right staff that goes there, that it's sequenced in the right order. Um, just to let you in on some of the, the, the things we're doing, we're actually um, going to try to do better scheduling. We're actually going to try to measure the total amount of time it takes to do a work order. Right now, uh, we kind of report on the different steps of the work order. Um, we're going to need, as Ms. Velez says, we're at the point where we need feedback from the residents. Okay. So we do have some ideas. We, do, we are starting some pilots at some developments. We're working with the local resident leaders there. But I think you bring up an excellent point where it's time to kind of widen that, that net and kind of get ideas just not from a local perspective, kind of look at it more holistically and make sure that we address the complaints. During the presentation, it was tonight, it was presented that NYCHA could rebuild, that's quote unquote. Does, that, does this mean that NYCHA plans on demolishing buildings in the current portfolio to build new ones? Um, is that a yes or a no? And what does a process look like in terms of rebuilding? Again, this is a you know general. So right, what general. what what does this mean? Because the re, the gen next gen, of course, is not just about East Harlem, but it's right. so um, as part of the presentation, our um, main objective is to preserve public housing. So it's the preservation of public housing. It's also the creation of new affordable housing units, um, and it's also being able to make money for NYCHA so that we can put that back into the buildings to rehabilitate and again to preserve. 
public okay, housing. But I didn't quite understand. So you're, so rebuild does not mean that you're going to be demolishing anything. Is that what you're no. saying so, to us correctly? Am I correct? Right. So the in the rare, rare instance... We where, don't like rare. We worry about rare. <laughs> I don't even like rare so meat. So the focus... The focus of our the focus of Next Gen NYCHA is to preserve public housing. Okay. To stabilize the buildings in order to get money to repair those buildings. Okay. I'm just saying what I worry about, this is Gail Brewer speaking, is that Manhattan is looked at as a cash cow. And I don't want I'm just saying I don't want us to be the cash cow. I know we have four other boroughs. I don't care about those other boroughs. And I want to make sure that in Manhattan we don't end up being the place where we have more uh, market rate. We do demolish. I want, you know, I want us to be the same as the other boroughs in terms of the building. So is that something that's clear from, my, from our perspective? Yes, yes, that is clear. Just, I, I hear 100% affordable in other boroughs, and then I hear something about 50-50 for Manhattan. And I'm not too big on 50-50. Okay, I just want to make it clear we're going to clear. be fighting on that one. Okay. So um, the other question is, uh, will NYCHA be renting out ground floor space to anybody? Is that something that is in the cards? And I think that's a good question. Hi, my name is Karina Tota, I'm Senior Advisor to the Chair at NYCHA, to Chair Lataye. Um, the goal of that strategy is really to figure out ways to maximize the usage of community and commercial spaces to better serve residents, as well as to generate units. That means that that there are uses which may not generate a lot of revenue, you don't get a lot of rent, but it's what residents want. So it's figuring out ways to use the space, to plan the spaces, to get more whether it's community service providers, whether it's retail providers, into the space so that the ground floor, the street level, is as active as possible and also can provide more services and a mix of uses. Okay, but do you, have a, like, do you have an inventory of the spaces that are available? Who's in them now? Do you have to create new spaces? And I always thought HUD wasn't too keen on us doing this. So where are we with all of So it's not about the creation of new spaces, right? There is about um, 250,000 square feet of commercial spaces throughout all five boroughs. Okay. And some of those are occupied and some of them are not. They right. need capital upgrades because they're not in good enough condition. So who's going to do the capital upgrades? So we're going to work on ways to try to finance that and, okay. and look to external funding to see if maybe the new, the new retail tenant or so, community service provider can help with some of that. So you you could tell uh, in Johnson Houses if there are available commercial spaces. You have a, a, a database that lists all of these yes, spaces. And yes. who's in the, for a long time, we didn't know who the hell was in them. Yes, we but do. But now those, we do know. Yeah, those single-story window front spaces. Mm -hmm. So we do know. Okay. We do know. And do, are they all rented up now, or are they too many? They are need? not necessarily all rented up. If they are in the condition to be rented, they are rented up at around 95%. Okay. Okay? Right. And if they're not in the condition to be rented, then they can't be rented. So the idea would be to sit down again with the resident leaders to see where they think there are renters and not renters, because sometimes it's a different list, and to see what kind of renting they would like to have for that community. That would be part of the input. That I would, would be part of the process, yes. Okay. How many people have commercial in their developments? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are they rented? <laughs> okay. All right. So, that, I mean, that having that would be, I think people would feel very positive because it would feel like there was revenue coming in that was appropriate, something positive. Okay. All right. Um, the issue, just so people know in the outside table there, if you have individual uh, operation and maintenance issues, then you can uh, talk to somebody out there, just so you know. So, NYCHA has kindly provided that, and I appreciate it very much. What about scatter site? Um, what's the status of restoration of scatter site. I happen to know there are a lot of brownstones in some parts and other types of scatter site and often the type of construction material that NYCHA has for the taller buildings doesn't work in the scatter site. So it's a whole different maintenance situation. Right. And so it doesn't happen. So I'm just wondering. It's a hard problem. It but is the, a hard the problem. leaks are everywhere. We all have buckets and stuff. Right. And and we also share staff with our conventional developments with those scattered sites. Okay. So what's so this, what are we doing with scattered sites? So um, we're looking at the scattered sites right now, and we are um, going to speak to HUD about using um, their preservation programs 
um, to basically stabilize the funding of the scattered sites um, and uh, use programs such as RAD and, and things of that nature so that we can borrow money on those buildings and we can partner with... What's RAD? I know what RAD is, but the, what's RAD? Uh, what Mr. Bach referred to earlier, the Rental Assistant Demonstration Program, which is a special program that uh, HUD did. There's, there's two sides of that program, but there's a public housing public housing side of the program um, where we can shift the funding um, into uh, Section 8, but all the tenants maintain their public housing rights and enables us to be able to borrow money against the building. We're in the ownership structure with the um, nonprofit developer or whatever right. developer we end up partnering with, um, and all residents um, have the they automatically go into the program, and we're able to fix up those buildings. Okay. Um, I know that there are issues with RAD, but that I appreciate the answer. With RAD converted properties, what will happen if a converted development falls into financial challenges or default on a federal insured mortgage? So NYCHA will be part of the ownership structure, so we will maintain uh, controls if there are issues. Um, what happened to the OPMOM program, and um, do any, uh, any of us you know, live in public housing? Those are the two questions, but mostly with the OPMOM program. What happened to that program? So the OPMOM program is, is still ongoing. Okay. It's, it, is a, uh, it is a way to get decision making being done at the lower lower levels at the management offices rather than central office making the decisions. Uh, many of the sites have been able to get more staffing because of the way the funding is set up. Um, we are finding that some of the things they're doing are working out well and some of the things are not working out well. Uh, one of the things is we do have a scorecard. We're getting um, feedback from the residents. Uh, we are looking at all aspects of how those operate, those OPMOM places operate, whatever we're able to benefit from at the OPMOM sites, we're making, we're trying to spread them out to other developments. So again, I think this is an opportunity to kind of be a little more, a bad word, transparent, and kind of let you know, yeah, we, we've been in operation since the beginning of January. Um, yeah, what is OPMOM? So OPMOM is, is yeah, Optimum ahead. Property Management Operating Model. So it is, it is a way to, right now a lot of, I think someone else had mentioned that the housing authority is, is kind of a lot of decisions come from the central office, right? So that we're pushing down that decision making process down to the local management. They, get, they know what staffing they need. They need to know they have ability to, to use vendors for some of the work to supplement the housing staff, to really make changes to the schedule to, again, to be more customer service to provide more, to make those decisions without someone in central office telling them, no, it can't be done. So they have a whole different, they don't report to the borough structure, they report to a much lower level. Like I said, it's, it's new, it's a new responsibility for a lot of our staff. There was a lot of training that went on, there was a lot of training for management, there was training for how to they could use their funding in the most effective manner. Um, it's a learning process. We think that eventually that most of the benefits that we, we will be able to um, put out to the rest of the authority, it's really the way the other a lot of other successful authorities have run where they can make decisions at a lower level. Okay. All right, thank you. That again needs more discussion. So mm -hmm. um, Mr. Kelly kindly mentioned Judith Goldener, who's not able to be here tonight from Legal Aid. And I just didn't know how, uh, is there some way that Legal Aid can continue to be a resource uh, to help residents address issues and to help NYCHA as it rolls out plans. And I say that because um, Legal Aid has been a partner for many of us, uh, I think on both sides, obviously sometimes suing NYCHA, but at the same time working with NYCHA, knowing what your challenges are, and obviously very uh, involved and working and respected by the residents. So is there something yeah, hi. we can... Go um, ahead. My name's Lucy Newman. I'm an attorney at Legal Aid. Um, Gail, you're right. <laughs> Actually, under the last administration, uh, Legal Aid represented Douglas Houses and Baruch Houses. And along with the city council, we sued NYCHA to stop uh, what was then known as the infill land leasing. 
Um, and we were pretty successful at making sure that, that didn't happen, in part because of our lawsuit. But um, legal aid remains you know, available to offer technical assistance to residents' associations, and we do work with Ethel a lot, and we work with Douglas Houses and many other resident leaders. Um, we're here, we can do Know Your Rights trainings. Um, we're happy to come with Vic um, and walk through issues or questions that you have around Next Generation NYCHA and you know, consider us a resource that you can always come to with, with questions. Okay, I mean, um, thank you, as always, to all of you at Legal Aid. Um, the issue of you know guns and violence, which is something that we all live with, um, and I wanted to know. I know that the police are doing what they can. Resident associations are doing what they can. NYCHA is. Is this a more of a discussion in the past in terms of trying to figure out ways to do alternatives? Obviously, eleven o'clock at night at the community centers. Are they funded? Um, sometimes we can reach people who young people who are already reachable but it's harder to reach those who are harder to reach. And I'm just wondering uh, if there are super discussions in terms of this really important issue, how to reach young people who are having challenges beyond uh, something that you might have had internal discussions that we would love to know about. So with regards to the extended day program that we've had for the first time last year, it allows during the summer months the community facilities on NYCHA development grounds to remain open until 11 o'clock. The funding has been approved and for that to happen again this year, so all community centers will remain open until 11, those with gyms until midnight on Fridays and Saturdays, and they will operate seven days a week. And that's part of the mayor's action plan. Okay, so one of the questions I would have, is there any kind of an evaluation to see, even in the limited amount of time that you had, to know if this is making a difference in terms of people's perception and reality, um, returning to school, better services, you know, the kind of thing that would give you some kind of indicator that the 11 o'clock is working, because it is a good idea, but does it work? So I, I think the uh, we can definitely see in the numbers that um, so so for instance Ingersoll Houses in, in uh, Fort Greene Brooklyn was one of the highest crime developments throughout our portfolio last year after the MAP program that the mayor came up with was put into place we saw a 65 percent reduction in crime we if you went by the community centers on Friday and Saturday night at 10 11 o'clock at night. You would see packed community centers filled with, with teenagers who were busy doing things that were socially um, you know, productive rather than things that you know, maybe they shouldn't be doing. So we saw that throughout the 15 developments and, and other developments that even weren't part of MAP.